Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, a critical assessment of Canada's pandemic readiness. The public health agency did not address long-standing issues. What needs to get fixed before the next one? Also tonight, the federal carbon tax gets the top judicial stamp of approval. The Supreme Court's decision is very unfortunate today, but it is a reality that we must deal with. At issue is here with its take. In parts of Ontario, calls for looser restrictions, even as COVID cases climb. Hospitalizations are increasing and ICU numbers are increasing. And a new gallery, a step towards reconciliation. This show in particular, I think, is going to blow the roof off of what people think Inuit art is. Inuit art is at the center. This is The National. Overconfident, underprepared, and slow to respond to danger. That's the message today from the Auditor General about the Public Health Agency of Canada in the pandemic's early days. Auditor General Karen Hogan faulted the government for not seeing how fast COVID-19 was coming, though she did point to Dr. Theresa Tam's quick efforts to turn the ship around, and she agreed Ottawa responded quickly to the financial threat. David Cochran takes us through the details. In December of 2019, as the seeds of the pandemic were sprouting in Wuhan, China, the Auditor General says Canada simply wasn't ready. I am discouraged that the public health agency did not address long-standing issues. Issues going back to the SARS crisis of 2003, a failure to update emergency plans and improve disease surveillance systems, a lack of action that left the country scrambling. These issues negatively affected the sharing of surveillance information between the agency and the provinces and territories during the pandemic. PHAC wasn't just underprepared, it also underestimated the seriousness of the outbreak. Its pandemic early warning system failed to issue an alert. It's unclear why an alert was not issued. And here again, it's where the chief public health officer was key in the response uh, in the country, in that she was able to provide an alert to her provincial counterparts. The chief public health officer is Dr. Teresa Tam, who the Auditor General says covered for some deficiencies by relying on her judgment rather than alert systems that didn't work. And there's lots of things that I think uh, we'll look forward to in terms of uh, improving our systems as we move forward. The bull leader of the opposition. The Conservatives pinned it all on the Liberals. Why did this government shut down Canada's pandemic warning system even though the report documents decades of neglect across multiple governments. Uh, we agree that this country, along with all countries, will need to review our response to the pandemic. So, David, the Auditor General also found that Canada was unprepared for national quarantine measures. What did Karen Hogan say about that? Yeah, she found some real shortcomings in the period after the border was closed to non-essential travel. And what she found is that the government had a real hard time tracking the activities of people entering Canada and required to self-isolate. So in May and June of last year, the government simply didn't know if two-thirds, two-thirds of travelers required to quarantine were doing it at all. And then if they had someone they suspected of not following the rules, less than half of those cases were referred to law enforcement. Now, the government says this has improved substantially in the past year, but in the early days of the pandemic, this was another trouble spot in the national response. Okay, David, thanks. Thank you. Now, today, the government also announced plans for a new one-time payment to provinces, territories, cities, and First Nations, the money intended for health care and infrastructure. This legislation will provide $7.2 billion in critical support. Now, if it clears Parliament, the package would put an extra $4 billion into the Canada Health Transfer for provinces and territories to use, $1 billion of which would go to fund COVID-19 vaccination campaigns across the country, and just over $2 billion would go into the gas tax fund, which helps support local infrastructure priorities. Well, today, Canada added another 5,200 COVID cases to the national total, led by a noticeable jump in Ontario. It reported 2,380 new cases. Now, 280 of them are attributed to a data catch-up, but even when you subtract those, it's still the highest number in the province since late January. The seven-day average has been ticking upwards for about three weeks now. 
And that climb, as Katie Nicholson explains, has some now calling for the reopening to stop. Taking in the music, but keeping their distance. Jerry Brunner and his daughter Amelia are trying to be as safe as possible as COVID cases swell once again past the 2000 mark. That's exactly what I expected. There was no way it was going to be anything else with the new variants being out. Those new highly transmissible variants now account for more than half of all COVID-19 cases in the province and with serious consequences. Daily cases are increasing and hospitalizations are increasing and ICU numbers are increasing. In one place in particular. The Premier himself has called us an inferno. Peel region outside of Toronto with many living in multi-generational homes accounts for 20% of new COVID infections. And in the last week, its number of new cases jumped 25%. Many health professionals across the country are now saying we are entering a third wave. In reality, <laughs> we've never left the second wave here in Mississauga and in Peel. All as other parts of the province relax restrictions. Already, indoor dining has led to a significant outbreak linked to this Oakville Steakhouse. Public health experts say now is not the time for Ontario to let its guard down. We need to learn the lessons and we need to not only decrease this, this sort of opening up that we're doing now to prevent cases, but also to prevent our public health system from getting overwhelmed. Easier said than done. After a long winter of isolation, many today soaking up the sun maskless. Back in the park, Jerry Grunner says the government got it wrong. I wish that they'd kept the, the clamps on, kept the lockdown on until the numbers got down to where their contact tracing was not overwhelmed anymore. Now, he and Amelia will keep the world at a distance a little longer. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, the numbers in BC are also surging. It recorded 800 new cases today. Hasn't been that high since early December. Still, some restrictions are loosening. I am very, very pleased that we are at a place where we can make some changes that will affect people's quality of life. Effective April 1st, residents in BC long-term care facilities will be able to have two visitors at a time instead of having only one designated visitor, and they'll be allowed to hug. The province will also allow a limited number of indoor faith services this spring. Well, a crushing defeat today for three provinces fighting the federal carbon tax. The Supreme Court ruled Ottawa acted within its powers when it put a national price on carbon pollution. Chief Justice Richard Wagner wrote that climate change counts as a matter of national concern. He called it an existential threat to human life in Canada and said carbon pricing is critical to our response. Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario wanted the carbon tax ruled unconstitutional, but only three of the nine judges agreed. Dissenting Justice Russell Brown said the majority opinion is bound to lead to serious tensions in the Federation. Now, there's lots to say about an issue this big, this polarizing. Olivia Stefanovic starts us off with the politics. The legal debate may be settled. The issue around whether carbon pricing forms part of Canada's plan with respect to uh, reducing emissions is over. But the political debate is about to heat up. Canada's Conservatives will repeal Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax. The Conservatives, who voted just days ago against recognizing the existence of man-made climate change, vow to relitigate the issue in the next election and say they'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions in other ways. We won't be doing that by making the poorest Canadians pay. Right now, the three provinces that challenge the federal law have to make a choice, adopt their own carbon pricing mechanism, or have the federal scheme imposed on them. When it comes to uh, complying with this decision, uh, we're going to do it in a way that imposes the uh, uh, lowest possible cost on Albertans. The Supreme Court's decision is very unfortunate today, but it is a reality that we must deal with. Scott Moe says Saskatchewan is designing its own carbon pricing system, one that will give money back to drivers at the pump. New Brunswick tried something similar. The federal environment minister says that sends a signal to burn more gas. I'm certainly very sympathetic to trying to ensure that there is space for Saskatchewan to make uh, choices that are specific for its economy. But it has to drive emissions reductions. Otherwise, 
why, what are we doing? The minister says he will reach out to the provinces to try to find a way to work together after spending the last three years as opponents in court. Olivia Stepanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, in the world of business, you'll certainly find critics of the carbon tax disappointed in the ruling, but as Rafi Bujikanyan shows us, that's not all you'll find. That's germ wheat there. And to get it to market from his farm in rural Saskatchewan, Todd Lewis says, you need to burn a lot of carbon. We have to rely upon uh, rail specifically in most cases to uh, see, our, see our product uh, transport to export position, be it at the West Coast or down in the United States. And those uh, carbon taxes are added to uh, the fuel that the railroad burns and uh, it's passed directly on to us. There are other costs right on the farm. You are able, not able to get your crop off without drying it. It just will not dry down. And so you use natural gas or propane or some sort of heat source. And the bills can be into the tens of thousands of dollars. With the carbon tax set to rise to $40 a ton next month, some businesses had hoped for relief. We are still very much in this pandemic with restrictions imposed on small businesses across the country. And really now is not the time to imposing additional cost increases on small businesses. But with today's Supreme Court decision, what appears to be resignation. Last year, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers had asked for a carbon tax freeze. Now the oil lobby just says it wants Ottawa and the provinces to work together. It really just confirms where the world's going. Um, and the world's, uh, world's going to, there's certainly an energy transition underway. Then there are those trying to get in on carbon capture. This central Alberta plant says it's pulled the equivalent of 350,000 cars off the road. We're in the business of large-scale capture and storage and there needs to be incentive to do it. That incentive can take many forms and this is one and it's, it's good to know that it's, uh, it's finally been uh, clarified that it's constitutional. The big question now, what that might look like once the holdout provinces decide whether they'll implement their own carbon tax or stick to the one imposed by Ottawa. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. And now our chief political correspondent, Rosie Barton, joins us because, Rosie, what is your sense? I mean, what you make of today's decision? Andrew, listen, it is obviously a clear victory for Justin Trudeau's government and its decision on how to fight climate change with a carbon tax. It puts the ball in the court of those provinces now that, that didn't want this to either come up with a serious plan of their own or to stick with the one that has been imposed on them by Ottawa. What it doesn't do, though, fundamentally, is change the political debate around climate change. Remember, uh, uh, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says he's going to repeal this and put in place some system of his own that's yet to be determined, that he's yet to announce. So there's a very good chance that the next election will yet again be a battle over climate change and who has a real plan to fight it. Right, and more on that uh, on at issue coming up that a bit later. Looking forward to that conversation. Thanks, Rosie. Now to the U.S. and a first for the Biden administration, a full-on news conference. He started with a big announcement, but as Alan Morrow shows us, many reporters wanted to take things in a different direction. For President Biden, an opportunity to tout success and make new promises. We will, by my 100th day in office, have administered 200 million shots in people's arms. I know it's ambitious, twice our original goal, you could talk a little bit about but reporters did not ask about the pandemic. Biden pressed on other challenges instead. The crisis at the southern border, calls for gun control after two mass shootings, and rising international tensions. We're going to move on these one at a time, try to do as many simultaneous as we can. But doing much of anything is difficult. Get used to hearing the word filibuster. It means passing most laws requires getting 60 votes in the Senate. Democrats don't have that many. They can change the rules, but there's reluctance to take the so-called nuclear option. It's being abused in a gigantic way. Biden, an institutionalist signaling in his strongest language, yet he's open to Democrats going it alone. If there's complete lockdown and chaos as a consequence of the filibuster, then we'll have to go beyond what I'm talking about. After signing a $1.9 trillion COVID rescue plan, Biden is now targeting a $3 trillion infrastructure package. I can't guarantee we're going to solve everything, but I can guarantee we can make everything better. 
Have you decided whether Biden was asked if he'll run again in 2024? By then, he'd be 81 years old. No, an answer is yes. My plan is to run for re-election. That's my expectation. But Biden was quick to say his focus is right now with an agenda that's one of the most expansive in recent history. Republicans are not the only obstacle. Biden has to worry about friction in his own party, too, between the progressive and centrist wings. Building back better, as Biden calls it, will mean bridging gaps within the Democrats themselves. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Well, CBC News has learned that NHL players coming to Canada will face relaxed quarantine rules over the next few weeks. The Canadian government will allow hockey players traded from the U.S. to quarantine for only one week instead of two. But players will also undergo additional COVID testing. The league's trade deadline is on April 12th. According to a source, all provinces with NHL teams are on board with the new measures. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is now being tested in children under 12. The companies hope to be able to expand vaccination to that age group by early next year. Pfizer has already been testing the shot in kids aged 12 to 15, and it's already approved here in Canada for anyone 16 or older. Well, a 21-year-old has been arrested for the attempted murder of a Montreal police officer in a case that led to the wrongful arrest of a black man nearly two months ago. We hope that the arrest of the real suspect in this case will allow him to close a chapter on this event, which had important consequences for him as well. In January, Mamadi Kamara was arrested after a police officer was assaulted during a routine traffic stop. He spent six days in jail before being cleared of all charges. Now, with reports of anti-Asian racism on the rise in Canada, there is a renewed focus on the many different ways that can take shape. Sometimes it's violent, but often in a school setting, for example, it's more subtle than that. And as Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us, there's a very deliberate effort underway to stamp it out. As an educator in a Chinese Canadian, Mary Reed knows anti Asian racism is alive and well, and fighting it begins with breaking down the stereotypes many students face in school. You cannot expect all Asians to be obedient, excellent, good at math, good at science. That itself, although a positive stereotype, has so much harm. It does so much harm against Asian students. So Reed and her colleagues at the Asian Canadian Educators Network organized a national virtual meeting this week. The goal? To come up with classroom strategies in the wake of the Atlanta shooting where several Asian women were killed and the comments made by the police about the alleged gunman. Yesterday was a really bad day for him and this is what he did. So how do you unpack and deconstruct the police briefing report, for example. So those kinds of strategies where we really um, support educators to teach students to be anti-racist. Mary Tran experienced anti-Asian racism when she was a child. I was born here in Canada. My family, refugees from Vietnam. So uh, I grew up bilingual, um, but I went to school um, and they put me in ESL. So when she became a teacher, she knew she wanted to be a role model of change for young people, including her nieces and nephews. Throughout the document, they weave their experiences of discrimination. So Tran and her colleagues from the Toronto District School Board put together a resource document. It helps educators spot and address anti-Asian racism within schools. I mean, well, this is a start to the work, but I definitely think that this needs to go beyond education because racism isn't within a silo in the education system. But with resources like what they've created, it provides educators around the country with an opportunity to share what is a lived reality for many of their students. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a CBC Marketplace investigation looks at a growing movement spreading misinformation about the pandemic. Do you think COVID is a hoax? Yes, I do, 100%. Next, inside a boot camp charging hundreds of dollars to train people how to spread COVID conspiracies. Art from Canada's North gets a new home in the South. This show in particular, I think, is gonna blow the roof off of what people think Inuit art is. And a grandmother in long-term care gets a wedding window seat. She just started to cry, and then I started to cry, and everybody was crying. A family shares a special moment. We're back in two.
Well, some major damage in parts of the southern United States today as a severe and deadly weather system tore through the region. In Alabama, at least five deaths have been reported after a tornado touched down. It also left thousands without power. Parts of Texas, meanwhile, are cleaning up after an intense storm with golf ball sized hail. Well, they keep trying and keep failing. And now salvage teams from the Netherlands and Japan have been hired to try to free that giant container ship blocking the Suez Canal. The Ever Given became wedged on Tuesday amid high winds and a dust storm. There are now more than 150 vessels waiting to pass one of the world's busiest transport routes. New Zealand will become one of the world's only countries to offer paid bereavement leave for workers who suffer a miscarriage. Lawmakers passed the legislation unanimously, which gives mothers and their partners three days leave without having to tap into six days. New Zealand is reportedly only the second country in the world to introduce the measure after India. Well, the pandemic has led to a surge of misinformation online. False or misleading statements about COVID-19 are everywhere. And for some people, conspiracies have become a business. A CBC Marketplace investigation takes us inside this growing industry Here's Asha Tomlinson. Take your masks off, guys. These rallies are held across Canada. These protesters are anti-mask, anti-vaccine, and COVID deniers. Do you think COVID is a hoax? Yes, I do, 100%. Their claims debunked by experts. Still, they're spreading all over social media. Many people argue that this pandemic was a pandemic. A lot of it feels very planned to me. We're going to build an entire army to stand up and say, not only no, but hell no. Sherry Tenpenny is a prominent anti-vaccination advocate. She's hosted virtual boot camps, charging about $600 Canadian to share her theories and tactics. We signed up and asked epidemiologist Colin Furness to weigh in. Three themes emerge from this boot camp, and we've noticed them in our research too. One, COVID isn't dangerous. We've shut down the entire global economy over a flu, a, a, a flu virus. COVID is dangerous. If everyone in the world got COVID, 50 million people would die. That is misinformation. Two, COVID vaccines are harmful. This is genocide, people. We've now inoculated millions and millions of people worldwide. We have not seen a jump in mortality. Three, governments conspired to create this pandemic. It's a political agenda at the very top to take the entire global economy to its knees. It's hard to find anything that governments around the world could possibly agree upon. It doesn't make sense. There was also talk about vaccine passports, digital proof of the COVID-19 vaccination. Any advice on what's going on with these vaccine passports? Tenpenny's business partner says some hackers have told him they may try to forge credentials. In the background, this is what all the hacker cracker folks that are really pissed about this are working on. Oh, good. The idea that they might try and circumvent that actually, I think represents a pretty serious public health danger. Hunt told us he's not involved, nor does he support the hacking of vaccine passports. And Tenpenny said she stands behind her boot camp and makes no apologies for earning a living. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, CBC's Marketplace also puts social media giants to the test to see if they're cracking down on misinformation. You can tune in for the full investigation that's tomorrow on CBC Television at 8 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 in Newfoundland. You can also catch it on CBC Gem. Okay, ahead on the national, a collection of artwork like no other. Thousands of pieces of Inuit art unveiled in Winnipeg. We're going to take you inside for opening night. First, though, Rosie's here with Ad Issue. Enter tonight, we are obviously going to have more on the Supreme Court's ruling on the federal carbon tax. The Supreme Court's decision is very unfortunate today. What does this mean for Conservative premiers who opposed it? Chantel, Andrew and Althea will join me to talk about all of that right after this break. This is an historic day for Canada and for our planet, for the economy, and for all Canadians for generations to come. Let me be clear, Canada's Conservatives will repeal Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax. We will protect the environment and fight climate change, but we won't be doing that by making the poorest Canadians pay. 
we are going to consult with Albertans and also talk to our allied provinces uh, to determine the, the best way forward to protect jobs and the economy. The Supreme Court's decision is very unfortunate today, but it is a reality that we must deal with. Lots of reaction there to the Supreme Court's decision on Ottawa's carbon tax. Today, the top court, as we've been talking about, ruled it constitutional for the federal government to impose minimum carbon pricing standards on provinces, citing that climate change is a national concern. So where does this leave, for instance, the Conservative premiers who fought against it? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good day to have you all here. Um, Chantal, let me start with you. We did hear reaction from some of the premiers who challenged this today. What does this decision mean for their fight against the carbon tax or, or anyone who doesn't like the carbon tax? Uh, two things. For the premiers in the provinces that have uh, declined to put in place provincial programs that would have brought carbon pricing to the level uh, expected from the federal government, there is a choice here. They can um, keep fighting. Uh, that won't happen in the courts. That would happen politically, electorally. I'll come back to this. Or they can craft prog programs of their own, as Quebec or BC or even New Brunswick has done, uh, cap and trade, carbon pricing through a carbon tax that meets the federal requirements. The other uh, way to see this fight going, continuing, is for them to try to relaunch as the resistance 2.0, and again, back the Conservative Party federally in the hope that uh, Mr. O'Toole, who again today promised to scrap the carbon pricing uh, mechanism, uh, could or not become prime minister. But this battle can only be won in a federal election now or uh, with the provinces coming to different choices than the ones they made before they challenged uh, the issue in court. Okay. Andrew, your, your, your thoughts on, on where this leaves some of those people who are against a carbon price? Well, as a legal matter, it's now a fait accompli. There's no other court they can appeal to. Um, I thought the reaction from the premiers today, I don't think we heard from Doug Ford, unless I'm mistaken, but from um, Scott Moe and, and Jason Kenney was pretty telling. Uh, they did not sound like they were revving up for a, uh, another mm -hmm. battle on this. They sounded like they were uh, inclined to take this on board. And after all, they have a choice. They can either, ha the tax is going to be collected one way or another. Either they can collect it or the feds yeah. can collect it. And I think eventually the logic of that is going to come home to them. I thought uh, Aaron O'Toole looked quite isolated today uh, in claiming he was going to repeal it. I think if the premiers thought he was likely to win and likely to win on that platform, they might have rallied around him. Hmm. They didn't, I think, tells you where they think he's going. But ultimately, in the long run, this might be to his benefit. Which is to say, if, if this issue does go to bed, if the provinces come on side of it, if there therefore is no federal tax to scrap, then it becomes a non-issue and he can talk about other things. So in a way, this might actually liberate him in the long run. Okay, Chantal has things to say about that. But first, Althea, just your thoughts on, on where that leaves some people. Uh, well, I mean, we saw Scott Moe late in the day suggest that Saskatchewan might bring in a plan similar to New Brunswick. So I, I don't think that they're revving up for uh, the, uh, the conservative... Uh, political parties provincially and federally line of attack uh, against this. I think this is kind of the trains left the station. First of all, the Supreme Court actually wrote uh, the Chief Justice in the decision that climate change is real, that it is an existential threat to humanity um, for the fact that it is not uh, a finished dialogue within the conservative membership, as we saw last week. Obviously, the Supreme Court justices were not uh, <laughs> responding to what happened at the Conservative Convention. But uh, the fact that the court has pronounced itself on this, I think, is quite significant. Mm -hmm. I think it's very significant that um, we didn't actually hear the Conservative leader take, I think there was a line of argument he could have used in the Supreme Court's um, decision, specifically in the dissenting decisions, saying that um, the majority had uh, basically created this new power that would allow federal jurisdiction to intervene on things like um, possibly the administration of hospitals, that the, we, there could be a huge floodgate. We didn't hear 
Uh, Aaron O'Toole say that, uh, you know, take the line that we'd heard from the government of Quebec as well uh, in fighting this decision, that this was going to be um, something that was a risk to the Federation. Um, okay, Chantal, I think you wanted to talk about what this does for, for Aaron O'Toole and whether this um, allows him some room if, if a carbon tax is just a thing that everyone decides to go ahead with. <laughs> It's not that simple. And there is a reason why the Supreme Court went out of its way to point out that this is not about a tax, but about a yes. regulatory Regulate. mechanism. Yeah. Uh, and if you understand the federal legislation, it is a floor price on carbon that the federal government today was told it was allowed to set. That floor is the floor of an elevator. It is meant to go up. If it mm -hmm. doesn't go up, it's inefficient. It's yes. a symbolic gesture. So to say that if the provinces, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, put in place mechanism, that kind of makes the carbon tax disappear, that's not accurate. So when Aaron O'Toole is saying he's going to scrap the carbon tax, does he mean he's going to stop collecting it? Or does he mean he's going to repeal the legislation? Because if that is what he means, it doesn't really matter that everyone has a carbon tax. We will be back to where we were before the Supreme right. Court ruling. Yeah, go ahead. Andrew. Right. Yeah. But, if, but if you're Aaron O'Toole and you know that this issue is a loser for you, and he knows that, and the people around him know that, then it seems to me the sensible and smart interpretation that he would impose on it is, uh, I'm not going to collect a tax. That gives him a way to say, uh, that he's acquitted himself in terms of his base. He's, he's paid homage to the diehards. But he doesn't actually have to change anything, so he. You yes. know, it, it doesn't take doesn't take a lot of political ingenuity for him to say, uh, "We're not going to." You know, the, the the issue of the federal government collecting the carbon tax is what I meant. Uh, we're not going to do that anymore, and and then just stop talking about it. At that point, he can talk about other things, which, if he has a brain in his head, he would like to do. All right, Chantal, and then I'll. But that, yeah. but if you have a federal government that uh, is determined to never raise the level of the floor price on carbon, you have the equivalent of having scrapped the policy. Right. I except isn't the threat of raising the floor on the carbon tax what you could fight against as a conservative premier or conservative uh, but, leader? Uh, but, that's already but that is already programmed. The carbon yes. tax is set to increase. Yes. It, it, that's part and parcel. Yes. So you can want to fight about it, but I don't think farming it out to the provinces, franchising it, takes away from the debate. You either continue to increase it or else you might as well throw out the legislation. Okay, Althea. I feel like I might be lost in this conversation. I don't think that this is a like what is facing uh, Aaron O'Toole it is, a, is a decision about whether or not he's going to accept the floor. He's clearly said he is not going to have a price on carbon. Um, but, you know, we don't know when the next federal election is going to be. And maybe there will be no provinces that go along with what Aaron O'Toole decides at that point. Um, so there will be uh, mechanisms in the provinces possibly that already meet the standards and people will decide that it's a done deal. We don't know. Um, it's clear that he's looking more at a regulatory approach. I don't get the sense that the Conservatives actually have nailed down their environmental plan completely. Um, <laughs> I think today just... Uh, you know, proves to them uh, that they have more work to do on that front. Uh, uh, Andrew, last point. To you. I think whether or not to raise the, 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 the floor price over time is a decision that uh, a Prime Minister O'Toole would love to face. Until then, he's been given the opportunity by this to stop talking about it. Until then, he has the opportunity to change the subject that's been given to the by the Supreme Court and may be given to him, we'll see, by these uh, until now recalcitrant provinces. If the provinces that are most affected by this uh, basically accept it, I don't think you're going to see Aaron O'Toole out by himself saying, no, no, you guys don't understand. Uh, I'm still going to repeal it. If the business community is on side for it, including much of the oil patch mm -hmm. is on side for it, I think he's going to look more and more isolated. And I think he knows that. Qu quickly, Althea. Yeah. Well, it's only going to get like it's only going to get more intense for him to actually say something because the federal government has announced that it is going to actually announce new, more ambitious targets. It plans to align its targets with more ambitious targets from the United States. So, I mean, the discussion about what the Conservative Party is going to do on the environment is, is not going away at all. If anything, the bar is being set higher and higher. Okay. I, I agree with that. <laughs> okay. We could have gone on.
on for 40 minutes. That was clear. Thank you, everyone. Really good conversation. Appreciate it. <laughs> Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast, for extra content, including the panel's take on this story. François Justin, François Justin. Two in-person meetings in a couple of weeks for those two. We'll talk about what's going on there. You can find it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, and Rosie, a uh, sneak peek at this Sunday's Rosemary Barton Live. What have you got for us? Uh, we actually have an exclusive interview with the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Uh, we're going to talk to him about some things that he's working with our Prime Minister on, but also, and perhaps most importantly, the pandemic. Guterres really wants to see more vaccines going around the world and fears that if we don't start sharing more vaccines, that we are going to be in this for a lot longer than we think. Okay, sounds good. I'll be watching. Same. And next on The National, a new home for Inuit art. This show in particular, I think, is going to blow the roof off of what people think Inuit art is, and that is a good thing. Why the largest collection of its kind in the world is in Winnipeg, and later. There's so many opportunities of trying new things, learning new things. We are going to take you inside one senior's home where residents are thriving during the pandemic. Welcome back. Tonight, the Winnipeg Art Gallery presented this visual, though virtual, celebration of a long-awaited showcase called Kaumayuk. It becomes the world's largest public collection of modern Inuit art. Cameron McIntosh takes us for a look around, and he spoke with some of those folks behind the exhibits ahead of the opening this Saturday. From the outside, its design is inspired by northern landscapes invoking the shape of an iceberg. Inside, the largest collection of Inuit art in the world. Far more than soapstone carvings. Traditional, modern, multimedia. Like this virtual Inuit cabin created by filmmaker Zacharias Knuck, who sees this as a chance for Inuit to be seen beyond the North. Inuit artifacts are finally going to be shown in Inuit today. And I just wanted to be part of Inuit today. Kamayak is a nuktitut for its bright, lit, while not in Inuit territory, Winnipeg has a long and complicated history with Inuit art. In the 50s and 60s, a lot of it was bought in the north and resold in the south by the Hudson's Bay Company through Winnipeg. Inuit artists had little control. The Winnipeg Art Gallery wound up with the world's largest collection. What is the exercise of reconciliation, indigenization, decolonization? CEO Stephen Boris says in this case, it means giving Inuit artists a stage and control. It means rethinking how we've done things in this sector, what voice has led. Collaboration over appropriation. Many of the works are on long-term loan from the Nunavut government, which retains control. Amid some criticism, this isn't in the North. Heather Igluliukti curated many of the exhibits. She says it's about giving Northern artists a Southern home. That's one of the things that we were thinking about when we were doing this exhibition is um, selecting works that really show the vibrancy and uh, thrivance of our culture. The inaugural show mixes tradition with contemporary works, aspiration a recurring theme. I beaded the Nunavut uh, patch on one side. Like this sealskin spacesuit. Why wouldn't we imagine ourselves like anyone else? This show in particular I think is going to blow the roof off of what people think Inuit art is and that is a good thing. A bridge between north and south lit brightly. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, and just ahead, meet a group of seniors making the most of pandemic life. One, two. There's everything to do if you want to do it. That's a choice you make in your head. We're going to take you inside a Regina Seniors residence where safety comes first, but fun isn't far behind. <laughs> I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, we head to the U.S.-Mexico border with the CBC's Susan Ormiston to better understand what's behind the surge in migration. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Regina is seeing a sharp rise in dangerous COVID-19 variants. To try and stamp them out, officials are imposing new restrictions and urging people not to travel. Now, for seniors in most long-term care and retirement homes, it means no outside visitors. But residents in one well-protected home don't seem to be complaining. 
Bonnie Allen shows us how they are thriving together. For seniors who live here, Harbor Landing Village is a hive of activity. 73-year-old Jan Gable leaves her private apartment with a packed schedule. One, two, three. The retired nurse finds it invigorating. Now, 10 more. There's so many opportunities of trying new things, learning new things. I made a lot of really good friends here. She's not the only one who feels that way. We sat down with three seniors who are anything but lonely or bored. There's everything to do if you want to do it. Jan mentioned, uh, you know, you've got to be, get out and get at it. That's a choice you make in your head if you choose to be miserable. This four-story building is home to a for-profit seniors residence. The second floor is a licensed nursing home for 35 seniors, and another 40 seniors have assisted living apartments. Then there's a daycare, hair salon, coffee shop, and restaurant. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. But when the pandemic started, almost everything was shut down to the outside world with one goal. Make this the best fortress that we could, right? So that meant making some tough decisions around who was allowed into the building. More than a year later, still no cases of COVID-19. How's it going? CEO Jansen Anderson credits a combination of visitor restrictions, screening and sanitation, as well as vigilant employees who only work here. You know, endurance is a huge part of this, right? It is a mega marathon on steroids. What has not shut down are activities and socializing. <laughs> we did try and find a balance, you know, between resident safety from, you know, COVID-19 and their mental and physical health. So for us, you know, we didn't want to see our residents, you know, locked in their rooms. Every day I try to think about the things Thankful for. Retired grade one teacher Lee Eisler isn't allowed to visit the daycare children anymore, but she still reads to them. I've always loved being around children, so it's a great way to spend my year. 82 year old Jim Nettlecove was living alone in a condo when the pandemic started, so he decided to move into Harbor Landing Village in August. When you wake up in the morning, you've got to have something to do. Stimulation and a sense of safety have resulted in a sense of satisfaction, to the point these three didn't feel any urgency to get the vaccine. It didn't bother me one way or another. You weren't doing cartwheels and saying, yes, I'm vaccinated. No, it was just another event, another half hour in my day. If I could have, I would have said, no, I don't want that vaccination. I want to give it to the teacher or I want to give it to one of the um, healthcare professionals. We're in a safe place where we're well looked after, so I don't think we really have anything we, we should be complaining about. <laughs> beautiful. Almost everyone in the building has now had at least one dose of vaccine, but visitations, which were allowed last month separated by plexiglass, have been temporarily suspended due to the spike in COVID-19 cases in Regina. There are no immediate plans to ease rules and no real pressure from some residents to do so. And up to the sky. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, next on The National, watching a wedding through a window. How one granddaughter decided to make her grandmother's wish come true. Next in our moment. Well, Penny and Nathan were planning their wedding for next April, but Penny's grandmother lives in a long-term care home. And because of the pandemic, she had one wish to see her granddaughter get married. So the couple changed their wedding plans, deciding to make their grandmother's wish come true. And tonight, it is our moment. We're supposed to get married in April 2022. My grandmother had a few falls. She would say, you know, Penny, I have to get better to see you get married. That's my, my goal. When she said those words, it went right to my heart. I said, I have, we have to do it. And we decided, let's get married in front of Glendale Crossings where she's staying. They had her sitting there so that she could watch it. And they even cleaned off the window for us. And it was just absolutely amazing. 
my mother is the essential caregiver. So she sat in with my grandmother and had her phone on speaker. And so then Nathan and I had our phone, uh, you know, we would pass it between each other so that she could hear us say our vows. We said our I do's, we kissed, and then we went right to the window to see my grandmother and she just started to cry. And then I started to cry and everybody was crying. It was just so emotional. And, uh, and, you know, I just said to her, I love you so much. And I'm so glad that you could be here. Well, you know, it just goes to show you, we will remember this pandemic very much for the hardship that it's imposed, but also for the way in which we've adapted to that hardship, right? And Penny told us that this wasn't the wedding she had dreamed of when she was 10 years old, but it was perfect. That's The National for this March 25th. Have a great night.